Welcome to the podcast, Voices on the Journey. I am the host, Jarvis Lepper. Today we have Dave Mann. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jarvis. How are things? In the greater Moncton area? I am. You are. Just, just out off to Salisbury Road. We're neighbors almost. Almost. Throw a rock across the river. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave Mann is part of our Journey Church family, and you're married to Janice, and you have two children. And four grandchildren, your yeah. family's growing. You must be excited with the extended family, growing family. Yeah, yeah, they're all pretty much growing up now. They're, you know, the grandchildren. Grandchildren are all growing up. So there will be weddings coming down the road, I would imagine. Sounds like a good <laughs> time. Well, I have two interesting facts about you. I'm sure there's more than two, but I, I have two with me here. Is one, you're in, involved in bodybuilding. How long have you done that for? Yes, I have been uh, in bodybuilding for almost 44 years. And, and did you eat those raw eggs? No, I have to say I didn't eat any raw eggs. I did eat a a lot of eggs, but I didn't eat raw ones. Now, is there some myth to that, or is, is there a truth to that in bodybuilding? Well, actually, no. There are there are people now. You're going to go back. You're going to go back a few years, but there are people that did eat raw eggs. Okay. Uh, but of course, the the uh, uh, salmonella uh, once that came to light, that you know that you could really get sick over it. You know, they, they kind of stopped and wised up about that. Okay. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, the other thing is you were a cameraman uh, for CTV News for a number of years. Yes, I was. I guess uh, I'm supposed to use videographer. I guess that's the technical term. Is that correct? Well, that is today. Back in the day, it was cameraman. But if you want to be politically correct, I guess videographer is the uh, the right one we'll go with that and i know you do a lot of camera work with us here at the journey church for our online events and so on so thank you for doing that uh yeah no i enjoy doing it well we're going to get into the questions here in a minute i know you've been through a lot of uh hardships throughout your life uh, i think of your two heart transplants but the good news is your heart knows Jesus. And we're so thankful for your faith in him. The big idea that we're looking at today is abandon the road does not always mean the end of the road. And you've encountered a lot of bends. So thank you for being on here to take these questions. The first question that I have for you is growing up, you were in a number of foster homes. Why were you taken away from your biological family? Well, I mean, that's, that's a, a long story. My mother, my mother was, um, my mother was ill. She was a, a drug addict and uh, alcoholism. Uh, and it just gradually got worse. And it got to a point when we were very young that uh, she just, um, my father couldn't take it anymore. He left. Um, he had told us that he was going to Boston to have a, th a throat operation. And uh, a few days later, my mother, uh, my mother left and said she was going to pick him up at the airport. And uh, she told us to uh, uh, not look out the windows, close, make sure the curtain stayed closed, the door stayed locked, and don't answer it. And she never came back. So that was it. So I didn't see her from then on. And I had three younger brothers at that time. And did you stay with your family or were you all separated from your family? Uh, <clears throat> no, my two youngest brothers, they stayed together. And my uh, the brother next to me, uh, Bob, he, uh, him and I lived together up until I was 16. And I got in some trouble with the law and uh, the people that we were staying with said, nope, we don't want this and we don't want him back and we don't want his brother either. So they, they kicked both of us out and 
the Children's Aid Society had to find us new homes. Wow. My brother went to a, uh, a group home, and I went to another uh, foster home. Wow. I, I read that there's 400 children in New Brunswick waiting to be put in foster homes. It's such a, a great need, and uh, we hope that yeah. our listeners will hear that, and maybe people can sign up. Yeah. Children need parents in their lives and that stability. And, you know, as you look back at your foster experience, um, was there a particular family that stood out to you on your faith journey that influenced your faith journey? Well, I, I can't say that there's any one particular family that, that had a lot to do with, with my faith journey. Um, I do remember the the last family that I was with after I had uh, uh, after I had been in trouble with the law. I spent some time in in jail and 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 came out and stayed with them. And they were they were just so open and eager to help me. And uh, I mean, we could just spend all day talking about what they what they did for me but all the other homes i mean i i can remember being in in catholic homes and in uh uh homes that had a, a mormon influence a, a jehovah witness influence a baptist influence um so i mean there was just a a whole list of different uh religions and we're, we're glad that you stuck with the baptist <laughs> Because you were taken away from your family, how did you cope with that pain? Well, that was that was hard. It's um, you and I had talked about uh, um, the other day about anger, and uh, you know, I got I got thinking about that, and and I guess uh, my anger really kicked off. There was one day. Uh, like I said, my, my, I, there were the two of us, Bob and myself, and my two youngest brothers, uh, Jim and John. And uh, we all had to go to court one day. And we basically went into court and we just had to say our names. And it was just to be identified. And when we went back to school, the kids were making fun of us, uh, Bob and I, as we walked into the school, and they were calling us orphans. And uh, that was quite hard. Um, sorry. Um, because I wasn't an orphan. An orphan doesn't have any parents. I believed I still had parents. And that's when, that's when my anger kicked in. And... Um, it wasn't, uh, and, and I was only uh, 10, 11 years old at that time. And it, that stayed with me until I was into my teens, uh, late teens, early 20s. Okay. And I know when people go through some trauma in their lives, there's this deep hurt and people turn to drugs, they they turn to anger, they turn to so many things. And I think it's so important to be aware of that. And what are some of the good things that we can turn to so we're not turning to those bad things, drugs and rage? Well, I mean, I got, I, like I say, I got, in, I got in trouble when I was 16 and I ended up in the Don Jail, which is a very notorious it's a museum now but it's a very notorious uh jail in toronto um and uh it's it, it's it's funny because um uh, you're involved with harvest house and cal uh what's his last name cal's last name Mas i'm sorry mascary yes cal well uh i read cal's book and Cal's father and I were in the Don Jail at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
But when I came out of there, th my thing was never again. I will not end up there again. And I knew that I had to make changes. And uh, it, it didn't happen overnight. And um, it, was, it was a long time coming. And uh, it was after that that I, I started uh, getting more involved in church. I moved down. I was in a, in a Baptist church in Scarborough. Um, and, I, and then I, I left there and I came to Moncton. I came to Moncton in 1967. And uh, I got involved in the Reformed uh, Baptist Church, which was the former Wesleyan. Uh, and uh, that was way before they built this big church that they have now. They were down on Queen Street. And uh, I got involved with them and, and actually became a youth leader and, and uh, was, uh, was quite involved with that church for a while. Okay. What kind of things did you like doing as a youth leader? What was your favorite thing to do? Oh, it was it was just taking the kids to all of the all of the different uh, churches and the uh, and sports and get and, and just allowing them to get out and have fun. Okay. That was that was the whole the the great experience. I mean, I just enjoyed doing that uh, because I I don't remember having fun when I was a kid. <laughs> Create some fun for the other kids. So that's wonderful. You mentioned your mom. You eventually reconnected with her later in life. What was that experience like? Well, my mother called the, the home that I was living in, the Children's Aid, when I was 16, um, uh, gave, gave her a phone number that she could contact. And I came home one day, and the, the mother of the home talked to me and said that she had this number and she said if I didn't want to call it I didn't have to it was my choice she said you're 16 now you don't have to call it well you know I mean I I wanted to know like you know like, are you okay what's going on um, so I, uh, I I called it and uh, I went downtown uh, that weekend to meet my mother and uh, she met me at the door and she had a bottle of beer in her hand and passed one in one hand and one in the other and, and was passing me a beer and I was 16 and the first thing she asked me is if do you want to go down to the pool hall? <laughs> so in, in our conversation I had told her that I played quite a bit of pool in, in those days and, and uh, so yeah it um, I realized that there really wasn't going to be a connection there because she was still drinking um, and doing drugs. And uh, after I moved here, um, she would come down here and uh, stay with her father and her great aunt. And that's where I, I was living when I came here. And she would get drunk and stoned and, you know, and they would call me and say, like, she's out of hand. I can't handle her. I can't deal with it. So I would have to go down and take her and I would normally take her. And I took her uh, twice to the uh, St. John uh, Hospital, the the uh, asylum that used to, I, I, I don't know the proper word, the uh, that used to be in St. John, and and uh, she voluntarily admitted herself in there uh, because I had more or less convinced her to do it. And then, um, but but it but by doing that, she was able to sign herself out. So she would just sign herself out, disappear, and then come back, show back up in uh, eighteen to twenty four months, and do the same thing all over again, until one day she. Um, they called me and said that she had fallen down the stairs and it was only a couple of stairs. I got over there. She had a split lip. Uh, she was just right out of her mind. And uh, I, I went, I got all of her medications uh, that I could find. Uh, the, the, every 
nook and cranny in the house had a bottle of alcohol in it and or an empty bottle and she had more pills anyways i got her up to the hospital and uh, they admitted her uh we got her into a room and uh I told her, I said, look, I said, you lay down and have a rest. I'm going to go down and get some lunch. And uh, I went down to get something to eat. And when I came back, she had gone into a coma. And uh, she was in that for, I forget exactly, 30 or 40 days. And came out and couldn't walk and couldn't talk. And it took us, uh, it took us almost a year, uh, my aunt and myself working with her to get her back into uh, uh, where she could could uh, at least uh, get dressed and um, uh, feed herself. But she was never herself again. Uh, she couldn't be by herself. She had to go back to St. John, and she was put in this time by the doctors. So she couldn't sign herself out. And then eventually that place closed down, and they moved her back to Moncton, and um, uh, they called me and asked if, you know, if I wanted them to move her back here or somewhere else. And I said, well, no, here. I mean, I was going to St. John to see her like every couple of weeks. And so they, they eventually moved her back here and, and, um, uh, put her in a group home. And, and, uh, and then, uh, when she was 65, we were able to get her into, uh, Spencer's. And she spent a couple of years there and then passed away. Wow, that's so hard to yeah. navigate through that. Was there a time in her life where she looked at you and said, you know, I made a mess of things. Uh, I'm glad that you're my son. Did she ever reach that point? No. No, that's hard. Oh, she told she told me that she loved me, Yeah. right? She told me that she loved me, but but no, there was never, never any heart to heart. She was, she was... She was just too far gone. She was too far gone. And what about your father? Were you ever reconnected with him? No, never, never seen him again after that night he left. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because in my, in my head from growing up, uh, I had an image and don't ask me where I got this image. Okay. I might've got it off of the, television shows but I had an image of a guy that that stood about six foot two black hair slicked back black hair and I remember growing up I used to try and comb my hair like that and it wasn't until I came to Moncton and uh, I don't know I think I was maybe 20 years old or something and and my aunt found this picture and she said oh she said I've got a picture here of your father and she showed me the picture and I looked at it and I went really <laughs> I mean, he's just like a little skinny guy, and uh, I'm not sure if he was tall as I am. <laughs> totally opposite of what I had thought. <laughs> you know, Dave, we, we live in a fatherless society. Um, you know, I grew up with my dad. He was always at home, um, but there is no personal interaction. Um, he just watched TV all the time, very angry man. You know, being living in a fatherless society, a fatherless world, um, what can we do to have fatherly figures in our lives? Well, I think that, if, I'm sorry, say again? How can we have fatherly figures in our lives to fill that fatherly void that we have? Yeah, well, I think Big Brothers is, is a good organization. Um, I think that uh, churches can step up in that area also, because I can remember as, as a kid, I used to try to attach myself to uh, older people. And um, I, I remember one instance where I worked at a store and the manager of the store knew my situation and he invited me over one day uh, for a, a summer barbecue. And I went over and had a great time. Anyways, I ended up showing up there one Sunday morning just out of the blue at his place. I thought he was, he was a friend and 
you know, whatnot. And he basically told me, he said, hey, you can't be doing that. He said, I invited you over for a party. He said, I, you know, he said, you know. So anyways, I, that, that, was, that was the type of thing that I tried to do, right? And, and I think kids, kids try to do that. They, you know, they need to have a father in their lives. Absolutely. You mentioned about walking away from the faith at an earlier age, but did God's grace keep bugging you until you came back? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I have to say that there's a couple of times that I've, that I've walked away and it's been for, for different reasons that, that I have walked away. But I, I can also say that he never, he never left me. Okay. He never left me after, after I got, um, after I got a, a my divorce, uh, twenty eight years, twenty six years ago, twenty seven years ago, um, I I had I had left the church, and I remember some people at the at the church. They they came to me and they told me. They said, "Look," they said, "I'll always be your friend, and I'll always be here for you, but." you won't stick around because I'm going to tell you the truth and the way you're living, you're not going to want to hear it. And that was true. That was true. They, they, you know, uh, I just, I just stopped calling them because I knew what I was going to hear. And um, so, you know, and, and as far as like uh, going out uh, with other women there's, it was it was always in my mind that I would I did not want to be involved a long term relationship with a woman uh, unless I knew there was going to be a chance of a church relationship. So she had to be able to ex- be a Christian. That that was going to be the bottom line, or there just wasn't going to be a long term situation. And that didn't happen until I found Janice. And, um, and, and I was going out with, uh, with Janice. I mean, the, the, the way we met is, is a whole nother podcast and, and, uh, but maybe later sometime we can do that one. But I remember her, uh, her and I having that, that discussion. And, uh, I remember one Saturday night I had, uh, I, I had brought her home and, and before she got out of the car, she made that comment. She said, you know, she said, you're not living that lifestyle that you used to live. And um, so you really don't have an excuse that you can't go to church. And I was like, oh, right. Okay. And uh, I said, so what time, what time do I pick you up? <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, we're so thankful that God's grace does not let us go. Yeah. Dave, I know your health issues went unnoticed in foster care. And then what happened when you were 29 years of age? Well, when I was 29, I was working at um, ATV. And uh, one morning, I just didn't really feel well. And they, I ended up being rushed to the hospital. And I had a massive heart attack. Uh, they, uh, one third of my heart had uh, uh, been damaged. And the cardiologist at that time told me that uh, he said, you've been having heart attacks all your life. He said, pardon me. He said that uh, my heart was just full of scar tissue. And, um, and, and when I thought back on it, it was like, I can remember, I was always into sports, but I can remember passing out at the end of a race. I can remember even being in choir and passing out, uh, and, and different situations. And, and it was, it was always like, well, did you have enough breakfast? You know, did you eat a proper breakfast and stuff like that? Right. It was always put off. And uh, even even when I was when I was uh, let me see I would have been I would have been maybe twenty one or twenty two uh, I had a, I had passed out one night and uh, I thought well okay I have to go to the doctor and I went to the doctor and he set up an appointment for me to see a cardiologist 
and the time came for me to see the cardiologist and I was supposed to see him on Monday morning and on Sunday the cardiologist was in a car accident and was killed and so I did not get to see him and it was another six seven years after that that I had the, the heart attack so and then you got a new heart in 2003, 20 years ago, and then a second heart transplant 12 years ago this month. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Um, why was there a need uh, for two transplants? Well, I've got uh, uh, extreme uh, cardio. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm slipping my, it's, the word is slipping from me. Uh, my arteries clog up uh, really bad. And um, that, that's why I had my first heart attack. The arteries were just, I've got, court, there it is. I've got coronary artery disease and I have a bad case of it. They just, they just can't control it. They can get my, they've got my cholesterol down to almost zero and, it, they still clog up. Um, and, uh, and, and with the, uh, the first one, uh, first transplant I, I had, it was six years before I had any problems and I had a heart attack. And then it just, you know, I just started getting worse. And then I ended up back on the, on the transplant list. And they told me that uh, at that time, they said, your second, second transplant won't last you any longer than your first one. And it was six years after my second transplant, I had another heart attack. And it's just been getting worse since then. What were you thinking going into these procedures? I, well, I mean, I, I was... I was, um, I, I have to admit, uh, back, in, uh, back in the early 90s, when I was going to Halifax, they were talking about, uh, I had met a, a guy that was going to get a heart transplant. And, and back then, it was like, uh, it was a massive, massive deal. I mean, it's a big deal now, but it was even more then, right? I mean, the, the guy I was talking to was, you know, like they were going to have to put in big braces in his chest and big wires. And, you know, he was, he was scared to death. Um, and, um, but they told me at that time, they said, no, you're not, you're not ready for one. Time will come, but you're not ready for one now. And uh, so when the time came, it, it was, uh, there was really no, no fear about it. Um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the things that, that I said for that, um, a friend of mine uh, had come up to Ottawa, Harley Marr, and um, he came up to Ottawa to have breakfast with me. He was on his way to Toronto when I was waiting. And, and he put that question to me. He said, how do, you, how do you deal with that? He said, they're going to you know, they're going to take your, put you on a bed and they're going to cut you open. They're going to take your heart and they're going to take it right out. You know, you're not going to have a heart. You're going to be on a machine. And then they're going to put a new one in and they're going to hope that they can get it working. And I told him, I said, look, I said, before they take me down, I said, they're going to give me a happy pill. And I said, I'm going to go down there. I'm not going to know what's going on. And I said, only one or two things are going to happen. I said, when it's all over. I said, I'm either going to wake up and see Jesus or I'm going to wake up and see Janice. I didn't have any choice. It's not in our hands. <laughs> you get to see Janice again. And I did. So I did. I know there's a, a, a phrase that has been around for centuries now, and it says, may we live in constant readiness to exchange worlds. I mean, right. life for all of us is fragile. Yeah. Any of us can be called... Mm -hmm. Uh, from this life at any moment and so, yeah. but I'm sure this whole experience has reminded you how fragile life is yeah I can I can um, yes and and I can relate back before Janice and I got married we had uh, counseling uh, marriage counseling with Pastor Dave and 
we were going over like my health issues and everything. And, and I can remember distinctly Pastor Dave looking at Janice and said, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and, and Janice's comment was, well, I could die before he does. And Dave just got a look on his face like, okay, she understands. <laughs> and you've been married for 25 years now. 25 years, yeah. 25 years. And, oh, that's, that's wonderful. And it's great to have her support throughout all of this as you journey each bend of the road. So two new hearts. How has God renewed your heart? He just, he just allows me, he's, he's allowed me to, um, to keep going because, you know, I mean, I, I've also always said, you know, I'm not leaving this earth one second before he wants me. Okay. It doesn't matter what happens. Okay. I'm not going to leave one second before God wants me to leave. So I want to live my life to the best that I could do, right? And, and um, I remember after my, my first, first uh, heart attack, uh, it was, it was uh, I don't know, six, seven months after that, I went to the doctor and the doctor told me, he said, Dave, he said, you could die just as fast sitting on your couch as you could out doing something. And that's when I left his office and I went over and started at a gym. Wow. So, so doctors don't number our days. No. Wearing no. I mean, I mean, the doctor, when I went for my, for my first transplant, okay, uh, Janice and I walked in. I carried all of the luggage in. The doctor walked in and he literally looked around the room and he said, are you Dave Mann? Yes. Didn't I just see you come in here carrying all your luggage? Yes. Well, what are you here for? <laughs> I said a heart transplant. And it was like, you don't need a transplant. You're in too good a shape. Well, I have to admit that was totally devastating. Okay. And when he left and went out into the hall, I literally had to go after him. And I had to say, hey, don't look at this, I said, because this takes a lot of work, a lot more than the normal person, because I was in, I was in pretty good shape. And uh, I said, but it's the heart. And he was just like totally apologetic. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm, you know, he said, we've got to run our tests. And, you know, once we run those, we'll know. And anyways, after he ran the first test, he came back and he said, I don't know how you do it. He said, you got no viability in your heart. He said, if we go just by this test here, you need a new one. We got to run more tests. But he said, this one you've got's no good. He said, I've got people that are in, whose hearts are in better shape than yours. Uh, and they're here in the hospital. But he said, I'm looking at you. And he said, I can't keep you in the hospital because you're able to get up and go out. And he said, you have six months, six months, and you'll need a new heart. So we went home and I didn't go home, but I mean, we were staying in Ottawa at the time and um, we just waited. And it's like, I think it was two days before they called me. I was in the gym training. And then they called me and said, they've got a heart. You have resilience. You have perseverance. <laughs> Some people call it craziness. <laughs> but you've tackled each bend of the road with that and with your faith. And we're so thankful for that. Could you tell that story, the time you were on your bicycle and how God worked in that situation? Well, I was, um, I, I was on my, my bike. This is before I had any transplants. And uh, I was on an 18-speed bike and I was going, I was heading to the gym and I had uh, uh, saddlebags on the back of the bike where I carried, carried all my equipment. 
Um, anyways, I was going down Main Street and uh, a certain area there on Main Street, I started going up a little bit of a hill and I felt dizzy. And the very last thought I had in my head was, I've got to get off this bike. And uh, so what happened was I, I had fallen and it was literally right in the middle of a crosswalk. I had fallen and um, the lady across the street had came, the cars were honking their horns. She came out, she thought I had been hit by a car. She called the uh, police and uh, they came and they checked for a pulse. They couldn't find a pulse. They thought I was dead. Um, another car drove up and uh, this woman got out and went over, talked to the police officers. Uh, I'm telling this now from her perspective of what she told me. She said, I talked to the, the officers and she said, can I have a look? And she pulled back the blanket and she went, oh, I know this guy. And she checked for a pulse. She couldn't find one, but she knew me and she said, I've got to start CPR. She started CPR on me with no pulse, not feeling any pulse anywhere. And, um, the, um, and then another car pulled up and this, this guy gets out just as the ambulance is coming off of Von Harvey and coming down to uh, where I am. And the, the, the woman is yelling at the ambulance driver, what took you so long? And, and they said, well, he was called DOA. So we were, they didn't even have their sirens on. Um, and uh, they were putting me in the ambulance uh, and uh, I woke up and there was a headpiece on me and I was trying to take that off. And the uh, ambulance, the fellow from the ambulance uh, said to, whoa, you know, take it easy, settle down. And the other car that had driven up, he also knew me. And uh, he was talking to the officer and the officer said, there, there are, uh, there's another officer that's on the way to his house to tell his wife he's dead. And they had taken my shoes and my, and the, the backpacks, the saddlebags off of my bike. He jumped in his car, spun around and he caught that other police officer just at the top of the stairs before he knocked on the door. And he said, he's alive. That person was my pastor oh. at that time. He was the youth pastor at the Parkside Church. The girl that had stopped was a nurse from the third floor, which is the heart unit, the city hospital, who had worked on me for a number of years. And they say there's no God? God's at work. I don't think so. <laughs> you can't say that, right? Wow. God was certainly at work in your life and you must be so thankful for those key people and God putting those people in place to make that happen. Amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. With regards to your experience with two new hearts, you've had a chance to minister to people who are about to go through that procedure. Is there a particular story that stands out to you? Uh, well, I mean, there's been a, there's been a number, number of different, uh, ones. I mean, in Halifax, in St. John, in Ottawa, where I've had opportunities to speak, to speak to people. And the, the, uh, one of the last ones, um, I was in the, in the hospital in Ottawa and, uh, I was, uh, I had my, my, um, computer with me and I was watching some uh, UFC fights I'm not sure about that. and um, we uh, there was a gentleman there with me uh, his name was John and uh, we, we had been chatting and we had been talking and and he and uh, you know we had uh, 
been talking about our our experiences and and I had a chance to witness to him and and we had a really good conversation and he said are you going to watch the fights tonight and I said yes I am and he said do you mind if I come and join you I said no problem and uh, so the the time came for the fights and I didn't see him I didn't he didn't show up and the next morning I asked and he had passed away uh, but um, but right now um, I have an opportunity that uh, I had the city hospital call me and ask me if I would talk to a, a young fella who's he's had a kidney transplant but now he needs a heart transplant and uh, so I've been talking to him and and trying to explain to him the different things that are going on. Um, um, I've been able to talk to him about uh, about the Lord and about church. And, and uh, you know, he was involved in church when he was younger and he just kind of moved away from it. And, uh, you know, so the more chance I get to talk to him, the more he'll uh, hopefully try and get back to it. Well, we pray for more opportunities for you. And we're so thankful for those conversations you've already had. With your heart condition, you recently went through COVID. Was this experience worse than your two transplants? Well, it was extremely hard on me. I, I have not been able to train. Uh, I've been able to do very little since then. Um, I have been diagnosed with long COVID. Um, I've... Uh, I, I already had uh, bad lungs to start with before I got COVID, and um, the COVID just made it made it worse. And when I was up to the Ottawa uh, in September, uh, the doctor told me at that time she said that that episode of COVID was the worst thing that my body had ever been through. She said. And, and my last transplant was not an easy one. My last transplant was a very hard one. It was hard on my body. It was, um, it, they, they had to, the right side of the heart wasn't working properly and they had to put a pacemaker in and um, I got pneumonia. And so like I, I went, my body went through quite a bit through that one. But according to her, this, this COVID was the worst thing that my body's ever been through. And you've had Janice by your side, your church family by your side. How has your f church family and Janice been an encouragement? Jan Janice, Janice has been there step by step all the time. Sometimes one step ahead of me um, because <laughs> sometimes I don't remember things and she's the one that'll keep me in line to where I have to go and we all need the that. dates. And, but... but um, the church family has been amazing um, right from the beginning when I was when I was first sent to uh, when I first went to Ottawa and the support the 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 prayers the financial support um, uh, all of it was has just been just been amazing um, and and you know I mean it's 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 really hard, um, and you know, f for me, mentally, um, because uh, people people don't understand when they, they 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 do more now when they see me because uh, I'm 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 old and 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 I'm I'm a lot more feeble now than than I was. But when they when they seen me before, I mean, you know, oh, you can't be sick. You're bodybuilder look at you right you know like you walk around with like 10 percent or less body fat and you know and 195 pounds you can't be sick you know but uh uh yeah so i mean that that part that part there plays mind games with you but and we as a church we want to be a support for you an ongoing support a prayer support an encouraging support for you and uh, I'm so thankful for how people are praying for you and encouraging you. Can you tell us about your next chapter with regards to your heart? 
Well, I have to go back up. Uh, it's only two weeks away now. In uh, yeah, in, in two weeks. And back up to Ottawa. Back up to Ottawa. Um, the last time, the last two times, they have seen on my scans what's called ischemia in the heart. So the the heart's not getting enough blood, and it's getting worse. Um, my breathing is getting worse. Um, they've got me on medication that's, you know, uh, it's, it's all goes back to the same as what it was before I needed my first transplant and my second transplant. And um, if I was younger, um, uh, you know, I would be, I would most likely be on a list for the opportunity for a third. Um, there's... There's, there's two things that, that I guess could happen. And, and this, is, this is the dilemma, I guess, that, that we're looking at right now. And the doctors have been trying to put off doing another angiogram. I've had so many angiograms, and I've had the doctors tell me so many times that um, I was going to die. And they were wrong. I didn't. But now they're they're uh, they're worried that um, if they do another angiogram, that I just might have a heart attack and die. The last time I had an angiogram done, they they did do uh, they they did it. They told me uh, at the time that uh, uh, you know I might have a heart attack, and I never even when I was on the bed, I, I was. I was kind of drugged a little bit, but uh, um, I can remember them saying, you know, uh, the doctor saying 10 milligrams of nitro, 10 more, 10 more. And he did something like 50 or 60. And I never thought about it until I was out. He said, you know, he said, we got the stent in. That's all he told me. We got the stent in. And I went back to my room. And I was laying there, and Janice was there. And uh, you have to drink a lot of fluids right after that. So, like, I'm just constantly drinking. And, and uh, I got this terrific pain in my back. And I said to Janice, I said, go get a nurse. I said, I'm, I'm having a heart attack. Or I had one. And the nurse came in and asked me what was going on. And I told her, and she said, yeah. She said, you had one on the bed. Um, the doctor's going to come in and talk to you. So that's already happened, right? But they were able to to keep me going. Uh, this this time, uh, if they if they do it, who knows, right? And the other thing that they're that the doctor is worried about, she's worried that she's that they're going to go in and they're just going to look and say, "Sorry, can't do anything." And. Uh, she she knows that time is coming, and we all know that time is coming. Uh, but she just she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't want to. She doesn't want to be the one to say like, "Okay, this is it, Dave. You're. We can't do anything else. All we can do is medicate you." As you look into this journey ahead, how do you see the peace of Christ? Well, it's it's basically it's 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 been the. It's, it's been the same. I mean, I, I, I've been in his hands for years, okay? I've been in his hands, and the things that I've been through, I, I mean, like I've had cancer taken off of my body everywhere, um, and that's all from medication. Um, I, I, uh, I've had these, these heart problems. I, I crushed my back. I, you know, I mean, I, I've just been through so many different things, and he's just been there. He's been there to keep me going, uh, and um, you know, I, I all I can do is just say, I, I mean, I'm in his hands. You know, I mean, I, I can I can turn around and say, you know, and I mean, I've I've said it before. I mean, I would rather just die and you know be with Jesus than to have a prolonged prolonged suffering. But again, that's not in my hands. Right. So.
that's all in Jesus' hands. So, And we hold on to those words from God who says to us, I will never, never leave you. Right. And may you really know those words. May you know the experience of Christ as you journey through this time. Can you speak to those walking through a dark valley right now? Offer some words of hope. Offer some words of encouragement. Maybe there's someone going through a similar story like you or some other valley. Could you speak to that right now? Well, I think that you have to, you, you have, to have faith. Okay? Now, faith can come in in different directions i've got faith in god faith in christ and by doing that um i can turn around and 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 i can i can have anybody qualified uh give me surgery okay and i don't have to be concerned because God is directing their hands, even if they're not Christians. Okay, even if they're not Christians, they can be Muslims, they can be anything, right? But God is directing their hands on what they do with me. Okay, and again, that's turning around and saying, you know, that it's, it's in, in, in God's hands. Whatever happens to you is in God's hands. But, but, you can't just sit back and say, Poof, I don't have to worry about it. It's in God's hands, right? God is going to take care of me. But if you don't take care of yourself, okay, I can, I can, uh, I can almost say for a certain, almost say, that if I hadn't have been as fit and as healthy and and eaten the way I, I you know my diet and trained the way I trained, I would have died years ago. Okay, um, because but but saying that, God gave me the opportunity to do it. Okay, and I said, yeah, okay, and and when you know when my doctor said to me, right. You can die just as fast sitting on that couch as you can out doing something. Well, that's God saying you can die as easy on that couch as you can out doing something, right? You know, like uh, how do I have to beat this into your head? So, you know, um, you have to realize that that uh, it's God that's at work, all right? And he, he works through mysterious ways. Always working. Um, and when we put our faith in Jesus, our confidence in him, our soul is in his hands. Right. What happens? And we hold on to the fact that he journeys with us and he goes before us. Well, thank you, Dave, for coming on to this podcast. There is an expression that says, kick at the darkness until it bleeds light. And you've been kicking at the darkness <laughs> your whole life and you've a glimpse of light. But most importantly, uh, Jesus journeys with you and, and continue to hold on to that. So thank you so much for coming on here. I pray that others will hear your story and be encouraged. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarvis. God bless. Mm -hmm.